So by the end of this, probably hoping 40 minutes lecture, and I want you to be able to identify whether we should be using team text or class supporter or yes, on correlation and scan on or the data you have. All right, so why the selecting purpose statistics is important? And then this is a data from, again, ICU delinear study, and then we collected data uh, from the patients admitted to ICU, and biomarker called S100 was drawn uh, from a blood at the ICU admission. Yeah. And then we follow a patient who discharged from ICU and then follow them three months, and then we send uh, assessors to a resident, patient residents to uh, conduct a cognitive test. So we wanted to see whether the ICU, uh, based on marker value, is predictive of a three-month cognitive functionality. Yeah. And then, <laughs> so this is actually a dot. <laughs> so each patient okay, is this, and this is a data. And then if you put the straight line, and um, you could see a line like this. And when you have two continuous variables, not the binary, it's a continuous variable, right? Biomarker and cognitive functions. And uh, uh, you could use a Pearson's correlation. So when you use Pearson's correlation, p value is 0.1, not significant. But when you use Spearman's correlations, uh, p value becomes 0.03. Okay. So different tests give a different result. And the next example, and this is the data from um, uh, one of the year before 1999, and data is from NIH. So what they did is for each disease, and okay, they counted how many research, research funds are used for each disease over a year yeah, by NIH. And then that's a, uh, the research fund is y-axis, and the x-axis is a uh, number of years of uh, lost due to each illness. <coughs> so if you show statistical significance based on this, and you could prove NIH is, NIH spend the money effectively to save patient life. Okay. So again, uh, continuous variables, two continuous variables. In uh, association, you could use PSO. p value is 0.539 greater than 0.05. So that's significant, and NIH is not using uh, their money to, okay, our money, right? Uh, I still pay tax, right? So <laughs> it's still in my money uh, to, <laughs> uh, to save patient life in Spearman. It's a highly significant. It's shocking, isn't it? So selection of statistical tests and could give you a totally different, say, different result. And we will come back to this graph and see which one we want to pick. Um, so if you pick SPM1 because p value is smaller, <laughs> that's a big no-no to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so selection of a statistical test has nothing to do with the p value. It has something to do with the shape of your data. Okay. It has nothing to do actually with the study design. <laughs> <Yeah. coughs> it has something to do with the type of your data, and not the study design. So this separate concept from epi. Okay, so we don't worry about study design, but we worry about shapes of data. All right, so the next one, again, um, yeah, student t-test, Maui in the test, and you could see different result. All right, so uh, what uh, Douglas Altman say, uh, which actually stay in my mind for a long time, He's a British statistician and also he's a doctor as well. So what do you think? Uh, what should we think about the doctor who uses a wrong treatment, either roughly or straight ignorance, or who uses the right treatment wrongly? Yeah. Most people would agree that such behavior was unprofessional and arguably unethical and certainly un uh, unprofessional and unacceptable. Yeah. So what do you think, the researchers? who use a wrong method, okay. either knowing or by not knowing for data analysis. <laughs> okay. And he said, again, um, and that should be considered as wrong, as wrong treatments are used for, for the patient, so it's a scandal. Okay. 
So many people actually use uh, the numerous studies, and many people actually do make a mistake, and in many cases, and they use a wrong statistical method and to analyze data. Okay. So that's the ethical thing, right? Because if you use a wrong method and not to prove drug is effective, and then who actually end up taking the harm of that? That's the patient, right? So the patients are waiting for new drug being approved, but you mm -hmm. use the wrong method to analyze. So you are putting patient at the risk. And the same thing, if you prove the wrong drug based on wrong analysis, on a good day responsible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many, many yeah, papers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a reviewer's responsibility, author's responsibility, both. Yeah. So factors to be considered for test selection. Yeah, it's not that difficult at all. And if you answer these seven questions, it will lead you to the right statistics. And what are seven questions? Okay. And first, univariate or multivariable. And I will uh, explain one by one. Uh, difference, are you looking at difference? Are you assessing correlations? Are data paired? Uh, what is the type of outcome? Is it binary? If it's continuous variable, it's normally distributed, it's not normally distributed. How many groups are you comparing? And then what is the sample size you have? So these are questions, and we answer one by one, and then it will lead you to the right statistics. So these are statistical method to choose. And then uh, the way you use this table, it goes this way. Okay, you answer first questions. Okay, let's say I'm doing RCT, so I'm not worrying about confounders. So I'm not adjusting for confounder, and that you might pick an, an a univariable analysis. I say univariate, it's the same thing, univariable or unadjusted. Okay. Or if you're doing observational study, you might pick statistical adjustment that goes to one variable. <coughs> anyway, question two, I'm not looking at correlation, I'm looking at difference. And three, and uh, data are independent. And I'll go over one by one more carefully. But anyway, I'm just showing how to use this table. And this is a continuous number of two, and that leads to student test. So this is how you use this table. It goes from here to there. Okay. And, uh, and in this course, I'm going to show you how to do this mini test. So we will be analyzing data using this test. And there are some tests a little bit too advanced for this course. And I'm hoping we have passed that too for some institute <laughs> and we can cover those uh, methods. But anyway, so let's look. Question one, univariate or multivariate? It's very simple. If you do RCT, you might be okay to do univariate. But if you're not, you are doing observational study, always have to be multivariate. Okay, so regression. I say multivariable. That's the more correct terminology than multivariate. Multivariable. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then, um, so I say that. Okay, the same thing. Okay, so I just say about very, so let me move on. And we show, we already looked at this example. So, uh, we will be skipping. If it's not randomized, and then you can have confounding. This is the same example you look. So you do have to use multivariable regression to adjust for the difference between aspirin and non-aspirin users. Okay, so that's a question one. We saw this already. Okay, in question two, difference. Okay, do you want to test a difference of let's say blood pressure between two groups or you have only one group and you want to see correlations okay and correlation could be a little bit hard concept so easy way to understand uh, the difference between two is whether you have a multiple groups when you have a multiple groups two groups three groups you are probably <coughs> looking at the difference okay but when you have only one group okay so this one, and we are looking at patient who came to ICU as one group, okay? and then we want we assess both biomarker and three months cognition. Okay? 
and then we want to see when the biomarker increase and then correlation score decrease or increase. Okay. So this is all the correlation. And so this is the type of analysis you're thinking to do. That's a correlation. So you might do Pearson's correlation or Spearman's correlation. And I'll tell you the difference between the two later. But if you are thinking this one, you have a two groups of patients, and then you are comparing, in this case, like mean of delirium days between patients with apoe 4 gene and without apoe 4 gene. So you're comparing two groups, then you are looking more of a difference rather than correlation. Okay. So that's uh, question number one. So if you're looking at difference in it, rather than Pearson coordination and Spearman coordination, you might be doing, um, might want to do student T test or Mount Whitney U test. This one, I think. Um, okay. And. Um, So, you okay, so we are done with question one and question two. So we have RCT, so then grab this one, and then we have two groups to compare, then grab this one. Good. All right, question number three. Uh, if you are, only if you're comparing groups, the okay, difference, two groups or three groups or four groups, and you want to see those data okay, coming from one group, it could be before and after. Before it's one group, after it's another group, and you want to see these two sets of data are paired or related or not related. Okay, and so uh, one example, you are conducting a study to see this eye drop works or not. And then okay, if you are enrolling two sets of patients, each set include 10, okay, and then uh, each patient you measure right eye, <laughs> okay, for 10 patients with drug, and then other group of patient, right eye, but with a placebo drug, and you call it these two groups are unrelated because those are from 10 I and mean 20 different patients, right? So 10 observations with the drug and with the placebo have nothing to do to each other. But what if, if you take a measurements uh, from this 10 patient and right eye with a new drug and left eye with a placebo drug? So you end up having 10 observations, right eye and left eye. Right? And these observations are related because you know which observations are coming from which patients, right? So the persons whose I mean, my uh, right eye score may be related to left eye score. <laughs> yeah, my actually eyesight are the same in left and right, but my eyesight on my right eye probably different from your left eye eyesight. Right? <laughs> of course, because we are not related. <laughs> Okay. So when the data are paired or not paired, it's actually affecting similarity between the two groups. So you actually do think of whether you're comparing two related groups or an independent group. So what happens if you are following a group of patients and then baseline observation, no drug, but after three months, everybody gets a drug, and then you compare whether the drug is affected or not. So you compare baseline and three months measurements from the same patients, right? So those are relation are related or dependent. And we, we can call that. And the statistician make fast of that. And because uh, whether it's related or not, it's directly change probability. Okay? Because let's say let's compute the probability of randomly picked two people in this class move to Atlanta next month. And let's say each person have 1% chance of moving to Atlanta. So what is the chance? Two people from this class moving to Atlanta next month. Do you have an answer to that? Yeah. 
So one percent times one percent, right? If they are unrelated, yeah. let's say if they're married. <laughs> if the husband moved to Atlanta, wife probably moved to Atlanta with him. In that case, uh, two, two. Oh yeah, two cases. Yeah. Wife could be picked and husband yeah. could be picked. Yeah. So good, you say too. Yeah, in Japan, <laughs> I think it's usually husband. <laughs> That's not the case always, right? How the wife could be picked. Uh, so whether the two people are related or not, married or not, actually directly affect on probability computation. And what is the p-value? That's a probability. Okay. And so that's why statisticians make a fuss <laughs> or you know, ask you so many questions. Now, I know you have a two measurements, but uh, is it from the same mouse or different mouse? <laughs> Okay, well, the mice have to be slightly fast, so that's probably two different mice. <laughs> then I can look at them, that's independent. <laughs> Alright, so if you have independent groups to compare, and you might pick a student t test, student t test is a independent sample t test. And uh, contrast to that, we have a paired sample t test. So those are two different tests. One is for independent sample, and one is for related sample. Okay. And um, so, this, I try not to spend too much, but anyway, I want to emphasize, again, importance of knowing which data are related, which are not. So here, this is the value of CRP, and then we measure, this is actually a hypothetical example, uh, during uh, hospitalization, okay? and it could be the patient with uh, kidney disease or dialysis. That's it. Right. And then we want to see whether the catheter, use of catheter increase uh, inflammation. So the larger CRP means high inflammation. Right? And unfortunately, I think we forgot to collect uh, ID. So we know two people are involved in this data, and then uh, CRP is measured every day. Um, but we don't know which observation are coming from which patient. So just by looking at this, do you think whether the use of catheter increase uh, inflammation? All right? So what do you do? You probably take average of these two and then compare average with the blood dots. Right? So when you do that, do you think there is a diff difference? Probably not. And now I tell you, I recover data, so now I know which observations are coming from which patient. In this case, what do you think? Do you think catheter catheter increase inflammation? Yeah, probably. Yeah. So what if if the data are interesting? <laughs> I didn't change the value. All I change is which one to collect. Alright? So, <laughs> so I'm sure you don't see a difference in here, right? So p-value is actually 0.113, and then in this case, p-value is very, very <laughs> yeah, so How they are related is actually dramatically changed p-value. So you know, now know, so you need to use a statistical test which can differentiate which data are coming from which patient, okay? And I tell you, linear regression, logistic regression, Cox regression doesn't even ask you ID. So if you are using those analyses, then you, it's a sim the same thing you are doing analysis in this way. It's randomly picked for patients. Right? And uh, there is a regressions and tell you, uh, ask you patient ID. Okay? Mixed effect regression or GEE regression. And those are the regression uh, designed for repeatedly measured data. And if you use those proper regressions, and then you reach to correct p value. Yeah. Okay. So, how data related are very, very important mm -hmm. when we compute the p value. Uh, okay. So, independent sample t test, pair t test you could see dramatically different results, just like two figures we saw, 
right? And question number four, we move on, and type of outcome. That is a level of measurement for outcome variable, right? So we have actually uh, three different types, like blood pressure, cholesterol level, uh, inflammation marker, uh, dose of drug, and we might consider those as a continuous variable. Some people call it interval variable. Yeah. And whereas death and alive, they have two level, and we call it binary or dichotomous variable. Yeah. And then uh, when you have a variable which has more than uh, three categories or more, yeah. and when they have order in it, like uh, disease, uh, mild, uh, moderate and severe, uh, disease severity, and we call it ordinal categorical variable. Yeah. Or you have a uh, color over here, red and brown and uh, brown and black, those that do not have order to it, so we call it nominal categorical variable. Yeah. So the type of outcome variable uh, gives you a different type of statistical method. So when you are comparing two groups, but outcome variable is a blood pressure you're comparing, then you might use student t-test if there is no dependency between the group, no pairing. Okay. If it's pair, you might use student t uh, pair t-test instead of student t-test. But when the outcome is a binary, whether the patient survive or not, and comparing two groups, instead of t-test, you might use chi-square test. So the difference is type of outcome variable. All right. And question number five, and normality. So when you are using continuous outcome variable, binary, we don't talk about skewness, but when you have a not continuous outcome variable, we do have to worry about shape of the, no, uh, the variable, if it's normally distributed or skewed. Uh, so when you have a normally distributed outcome variable, like uh, blood pressure is usually normally distributed, cholesterol a little bit skewed. HbA1c a little bit skewed. Age is usually uh, normal, but we want to compare age as outcome. Um, but days of hospitalization, skewed, right? Can I go negative? Some people stay in hospital longer than others. Dose of drug, skewed. <coughs> Biomarker, typically skewed. Very skewed, some markers, okay? And so when you have a normally distributed variable and you might use student t-test, but when you have a skewed variable and uh, you use a non-parametric test. So, my weekly U test and Will Coxon rank, some Will Coxon sign rank, and Spearman's, they are all non parametric. So you don't have to worry about distribution of data. It works with the skewed data. But when you have a T test and ANOVA, uh, linear regression, and those are, or PRT tests the same way, and it assumes normality. Okay. So those are parametric tests and it does not work well with skewed variable. Okay. All right, so I'll try to put it in here. I will let you read it. <laughs> so what do you think? Um, that graph with the NIH funding, and uh, which test should we be using? I don't want to go back all the way. <laughs> so the NIH, why axis uh, cost billions of dollars to spend for each disease, X axis is the number of life years uh, saved by each illness. Yeah, money is usually skewed. <laughs> Almost always skewed, right? <laughs> it cannot go negative. And many people don't spend too much, but some people spend so much. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and then time is usually skewed, right? Number of days in ICU, days in hospital, and days saved by, uh, by something is usually skewed. So that graph, we have two skewed variables. So which one should we be using? Uh, Spearman. Yeah. Yeah, so Spearman is the right choice. So, thank goodness we prove NIH spent money effectively to save patient lives. 
So this is a guideline from the New England Journal of Medicine. All right. It, uh, uh, it even talk about the exact method. The exact method is a non-parametric method for go with the chi-square test. Chi-square is a parametric test. And uh, it requires a little bit of a large, relatively large number of samples. The exact test is more like non-parametric. So what they say is, Exact method should be used as extensively as possible in analysis of categorical data. For analysis of measurements, non-parametric methods should be used to compare groups when the distribution of the dependent variable is not normal. Okay. So they have it in the guideline. Okay. And the next one, and how many groups? How many groups? And what statistician worry is gold number of two? Golden number is two. If it's two, student teachers. If it's three or more, ANOVA. Yeah. If you have 100 group, it doesn't matter. What we are looking is it's two or greater than two, three or more. Yeah. So that's the cutoff. Um, yeah. So why we use ANOVA? And so when we you have a multiple groups to compare, more than three, I keep saying three, but uh, more than two. So in this case, we're comparing drug one, drug two, drug three, and control drugs. Sorry, it shifted a little bit. Okay, and then you actually could use student t-test Let's say these are unrelated patients, and you are measuring. And you could use student t test to compare each pair one to two, or two to three, and three to control, or each drug to control. You could, you're okay to use student t test. Nothing wrong to do that. But the problem is, how many p values you computing? So, six p values you're computing, because six different pairwise you can do. And then again, issue of multiple comparison. Too many p value. Each p value involves five percent error. So if you have six, and you actually uh, you're increasing the chance to discover a signal just by mistake. Right? And so what happens when uh, you have more than one p value? Reviewers start asking you to do Bonferroni type adjustment. What does it mean? You need to either inflate p value by number of code person. You did. So in this case, p-value could be as small as, let's say, 0 0.01, but you look at six times, so you inflate the p-value by six. The p-value becomes 0 0.06. This is no longer statistics. <laughs> right? So ANOVA is used to avoid that. So what the no hypothesis for ANOVA is you can simultaneously test whether the mean of outcome is the same among these so if the ANOVA did not reject, if the p-value for ANOVA is greater than 0.05, and then what you can say is there is no evidence to suggest one group is different from another. If the p-value is less than 0.05, and you can say you know for sure at least one group is different from another, therefore, you might look at each of those. So in this case, you might not have to do a so, uh, so when you have only two groups, and how many p-value you compare? Compute. Just one, right? So you don't have to do ANOVA. <laughs> so the benefit of using ANOVA is when you have more than two, three or more. Then ANOVA is still compute one p-value, which let you simultaneously look all for groups. Yeah. So when you do uh, the ANOVA calculation, you find there are differences Right, that's what we do. So we first look at ANOVA and see if we know for sure there is a difference somewhere. And then if it's rejected, then we start looking each pair. And then there is actually controversy. Some people don't do any adjustment because we say ANOVA detected difference, so we don't even do confirm. That's the one way to do it. And some people do bump around anyway. Uh, but if you do bump around, if you will inflate PW anyway, there's no need to do ANOVA. Yeah. yeah. So the beauty of ANOVA is it might help you so that you don't have to correct for your PW for multiple numbers. 
Um, so what I'm capturing the more than the local post context. Um, this is the area that is highly controversial. And so some reviewers to be, you have to do both. But uh, what I'm teaching in my class is uh, the reason you do ANOVA is to avoid postal errors. I mean, the, the P, both are operations. And so what I say is if ANOVA detects the significance, I usually don't do the uh, I mean, we do look at the payloads different, but we don't penalize feedback for the model. It's the issue of multiple comparisons. I'm sure many of you are very interested in I have one whole lecture uh, on that. Um, so hopefully you have time to go over that slide. I, I quickly review the issue of multiple comparisons. So what's in behind is when you start comparing many things and you compute many p-values. So more p-value you compute and you inflate uh, false discovery. So therefore, reviewers start asking to um, make uh, cutoff higher, uh, harder, so that you don't reject hypothesis. So in this case, you inflate the p-value. Let's say you have a six pairwise, six p-value, so you need to multiply each p-value by six. So you make a p-value larger, so it makes it harder for you to reject the new hypothesis is harder to detect the difference. Yeah, so that's why it's lead to the monitoring too. During a study, if you start looking too many times, you're computing too many fee value, so it makes you harder to see the difference. Okay. All right, then the sample size. Okay, sample size is actually easy. It works only with the chi-square test. There's no rule of thumb to do sample size with t-test. A continuous variable, but um, I use a rough number usually. But anyway, when you do chi square test, and if you have more than 20 total, and you don't have to use the Fisher's exact test, but when you have less than 20, and then you start constructing two by two table, so what do you do in chi square? Is you classify a patient with a drug A and drug D, and then you have an outcome, binary outcome, whether the patient died or didn't die. So you can contract, uh, divide patient into four different cells. Drug A died, drug A didn't die, drug B died, drug B didn't die. So each cell, if the number is less than five, and then you might have to use the exact Fisher's exact test. And if the all cells are bigger than five, then you can use chi-square test. Okay. All right. So question one to question seven, we quickly went over. <laughs> I usually spend more time on this, but we have so many things to cover in this uh, course. So um, I went really quickly. But anyway. So question one to question seven is we talked about univariate test. And we haven't talked about selection of regression. And uh, selection of regression is actually very easy, much easier than selecting a uh, univariate test. Selection of regressions, you need to know only its type of outcome You don't have to worry about how many groups and Normally, normally distributed privately, but anyway. Uh, two things, whether data are repeated or not, and then what is the shape of outcome variable. So let's say uh, you are measuring blood pressure, and, uh, and if blood pressures are measured only from one point of time. Okay. So each patient, single patient, give you only one blood pressure value, that's everything you have. And there is no repeat, no pair, small, no dependence. Okay. But if you're measuring right eyes and left eye, each patient is giving you two measurements. Okay. So, or if patients have to come back to your clinic today, tomorrow, and day after tomorrow, and you are repeating measurements three times. Okay. So when one patient gives you only one data, you can usually consider data are not repeated. So use the typical regressions. So blood pressure as an outcome, 
linear regression. Death and survive is an outcome, logistic regression. And death and survive is an outcome, but you know time and when the patient died or when the patient developed an event, and you could use survival analysis. In that case, you use a cost regression. Okay. And the same thing for blood pressure as an outcome, but each patient said we didn't do more than one measure for blood pressure. Then they repeat in your data, so you might use other type of regression, which is called a mixed effect model. And, uh, or outcome is not survive and death, right? It can't repeat. Uh, we cannot die more. But let's say uh, events is defined by recurrence of a castle. So the patient can recur more than one time, and then you have a repeated measurement. So you have a G or infection. Infection at uh, months one, months two, months three, and that's a binary outcome. So it is a regression for that. And then, time to events, you can actually do repeated measurement. Time of cancer be recurrence. Once they recur, you will do surgery, take it out, and then they develop it again. So that's a second so time. And third time. So this is the advanced model, but it's called a mock for configuration. It's not available in SPSS, but it's available in SAS or other uh, software. Okay, so uh, selection of a link. Over regression is much easier than selecting univariate uh, non regression type test. And uh, so there are many types of statistical tests, but it's not that difficult to choose each um, of that um, because the list of tests you see here is much less than the list of drugs you have to deal with. <laughs> Right? <laughs> so these are the, it's easy, it's not so not difficult. These are all questions that we have to worry about. <laughs> yeah. So the, the things statisticians ask you are the things we need to, the choice of statistical test. Other things we don't ask. Biology, they don't care much. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I wish we knew more about biology, but it doesn't affect on selecting statistical tests. So when you start talking about biology, you say, well, just tell me you have a binary outcome or continuous. <laughs> That's all I want. <laughs> and how many times you're measuring biology? <laughs> okay, how many groups you have? Okay. So now you know what we're going to ask. <laughs> right? yeah. Okay, so here's a tutorial. Uh, I have uh, five, I think four or five examples, and uh, I hope I give you a handout which doesn't have an answer to it. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, select the right test. And I wish I usually give you the heart, uh, the paper, piece of paper which have that big list with the questions, so you could. You could answer this by looking at the list. Today we don't have that, so sorry about that. I hope you remember, probably not, but that's okay. Um, comparing a ventilator free days between patients who are randomized to daily awakening and breathing trial versus daily breathing trial. Uh, so treatment A and B okay, among a ventilated patient in medical ICU. This is a prospective randomized study. Randomized study is usually prospective. <laughs> so. Uh, Okay, this is a randomized study. Okay, so let's see what is the type of statistical test that we have to use in order to compare ventilator-free days between two group of patients. So question one, is this univariate or multivariate? Regression, should we do regression or we don't have to? We could do regression, but RCT, we might do just a non-regression, right? Univariate because the randomization preserves balance and difference. Are we comparing difference in ventilator free days between two groups? Yeah, yes, that's what we want to. And are the observations are paired? Usually RCT is not paired, right? You randomize patient either into one drug to the other, so it's not 
uh, paired. It was a type of outcome ventilator free days. It's binary, nominal categorical, or that categorical, or continuous. This is probably continuous, yeah? And it's normally distributed. Days are usually not. But for now, let's assume it's normal. Then we have a different scenario, okay? If it's normal, and how many groups? We have two groups in sample size. Let's say it's uh, large enough to do parametric test. So what is the test you will be doing? Yeah, student t-test, right? So this is how you go from question one to question seven. It leads you to the right answer, right? So what if that we know ventilator-free days, it's terribly, it's bimodal, actually. Uh, people who died have a less, and people who survive have a larger number, so yeah, it's completely bimodal. But anyway, uh, it's not normal, so what is the test should we be using? What is a brother test to student t test works with the skew data? That means a non-parametric test. What is a non-parametric version of a student t test? Yeah, my way near you. Okay. And will Cox and Ramson be the same test? My way near you or will Cox and Ramson? It's the same thing. Some people call it my way near will Cox and test. Same thing. All right. So what if <coughs> it's normal? But if this is not from RCT, if it's an observational study, then we start worrying about comparing apple to oranges, right? Mm -hmm. So confounding become issue, so we do regression. All right, what is the choice for regression when the outcome is continuous variable? Do we have a repeat? One patient have just one ventilator, three days, right? So no repeat, continuous outcome and linear regression, right? So that's how you do. So if you do this daily and then we, you may click like this, I do it every day, so I don't even have to look. Um, but again, the list is much less than number of drugs. You know? <laughs> so it's very easy once you do it like one week <laughs> and it'd be like this. Okay. In example two, cytokine responses of uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, PVMC, from HIV uh, patient and with the prior TV <laughs> are compared with responses from persons with a prior pulmonary tuberculosis and latent. So, okay, I said blah, 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 but three groups. PB, uh, with uh, one group, yeah, so three groups, yeah. So that's really good. Good, thank you. <laughs> it's too many more. Okay, and then uh, we did uh, the in the case control study. Uh, okay, so we are comparing. This is so confusing. I did this uh, many years ago. So the cases is P B with sure. This one, right? So prior extra family TV, these are cases, and they have two controls. So they are comparing three groups. Okay? And then outcome variable is a cytokine, cyto cytokine responses. That's a continuous variable. Okay? And this is a case control study. There is no randomization. Right? So uh, the univariate multivariable. Okay, we probably do multivariable, but I think I'm assuming univariate. Let's assume there's no confounding. Maybe they are matched and I have a similar groups. And we are comparing differences between among three groups on cytokine responses. And those are three group of patients, and so unpair. And what is the type of outcome? It's a cytokine responses of a PBMC. So that's a continuous variable. And, and let's for now, uh, we consider outcome is normally distributed, and then three groups to compare cases in control one and control two. In sample size, we have fairly enough number to do parametric test. Okay. And so, what is the type of test we could do? Nova. Yeah, ANOVA. And how about if outcome is not normally distributed? What is it? Yeah, Crisco Wallace, that's the non-parametric version of ANOVA. And what if it's 
Um, so this is observational study, so we do have to worry about confounding. So what is a type of uh, regression? Okay. So we can forget about many things. All we worry about type of outcome, which is a continuous, it there repeat, and there is no repeat in this case. So it's easy uh, linear regression. And then next, we want to estimate the relationship between two numerical measures. That the graph we look, a uh, biomarker value from S100 and the patient cognitive scores okay, after ICU discharge among patients in medical ICU. So it's a one group of patients, and we measure two variables, and then we want to see whether those two variables are correlated or not. So let's for now go with the univariate and no confounding, just to assume. And, uh, and we don't have more than one group. So we have just one group. So we are looking correlations. And, and since we don't have a group, so we can ignore Q3. And what is the outcome? Outcome is a cognitive score. And that's a outcome, a normally distributed, continuous outcome. For now, let's say it's normally distributed, and then one group in sample size large enough to do a parametric. So what is, uh, yeah, it's a PSM correlation coefficient. And how about if the cognitive scores are not normally distributed? What is a brother or sister to PSM? Yeah, non-parametric, and it's PMN. OK? And then go back. <laughs> OK, so if it's not normal, then goes to PMN, right? Mm -hmm. In the next scenario, if it's normal, and since this is not RCT, even if RCT, I think we have to worry about confounding in this case because there is no groups, so we cannot say groups are the similar. So if we worry about confounding, yeah, so person who have a higher biomarker value could be older patient. So the relationship you're seeing could be confounded by just the change in difference in age. So you want to adjust for age difference. So what is uh, regression? It's easy. Regression is easy. Type of outcome, continuous, no repeats. So linear regression. OK. And the next one. And so now I think you start getting familiar with how to use this. Um, and uh, so we'll, one of the person I worked before <laughs> compared proportion of patients with HIV infection who had a viral surge between alternation of an antiretroviral drug regimen and then start of regimen, uh, st standard regimen. This is a, a randomized control trial. Okay. So outcome variable is the percent of patient and whose viral load is over some cutoff value. So it's a proportion, over or under. That's binary. And then we have RCT to compare two groups. Okay. And this is RCT, so clearly we don't have to worry about adjustment for confounding. So we might go with univariate. And we are comparing two groups for a difference on the proportions. Are they paired? RCT usually two different sets of patients. So it's unpaired type. Uh, outcome is nominal, which is a binary. Binary, yes and no, over a cutoff right, of the biomole. And uh, number five is not relevant. In how many groups? So we have two. Sample size, good enough to do parametric test. What is the test? Chi square, yeah. So it's a chi square. And what if we have a small numbers? Yeah. Yes. That'd be vicious exact. And what happened if it's not randomized control trial and then we had to do adjustment? Yeah, outcome is binary logistic, the logistic regression. Okay? There are several logistic regressions, so you might call it binary logistic regression to differentiate it from other type of logistic regression. But usually when you say logistic regression, that means binary logistic regression. Yeah. All right, I think this is the, the end. <laughs> a researcher wants to evaluate the effect of a new diet on weight loss by comparing patients' weight before and after the diet program. So we follow one group of patients and show you. And 
that we measure before and after the diet program. So everybody goes through a diet program. Okay. And so it's a univariate. You compare before and after. So do you worry about confounding patient age? <laughs> portion of male, the same. <laughs> so in this case, there is no confounding because you're measuring on the same sets of patients. Okay. And uh, are we interested in the difference? Yeah, difference on before and after. Are they pair? Yes, yeah. Uh, which is a type of outcome. Weight, yeah. Continuous. Is weight normally distributed? Um, probably not, but let's go with the normal for now. All right, number group two, sample size large enough to do parametric. But the test you're doing? The student t-test? Pair t-test. Student t-test is the same as independent sample t-test. So in this case, we have to do pair t-test, right? And then uh, outcome is if it's not normal, but the test, but it's a brother sister for pair T test, non parametric. Yeah, <laughs> Wilcoxon sign rank test. <laughs> there are two Wilcoxon rank sum or sign rank, and it's a happy sign rank test. I see many people put it wrong in the manuscript, and that indicates the person doesn't know stats. <laughs> That's my quick way to check. <laughs> Okay. All right. I think uh, we we did enough. Uh, I let you do this on your own. <laughs> okay. And you have a questions in your hand, right? All right. I think um, what time is it? It's it's three thirty. Oh my goodness! We have only half hour left. So. Uh, over the years, people ask me this question. I mean, when I do T test or when I do Monthly U test, okay, and what happened to power? And I thought many times, non parametric test, you lose power. Okay. So I want to do student T test rather than Monthly U test. Is that the correct statement? Yeah, right. Okay. Well, I don't really think that is the right answer, but let me do simulations. So I actually conducted the simulations and then and then found out the answer. So this is the result of simulations, and I did. And we probably can spend like ten minutes just to understand what I did in this simulation. <coughs> Okay, so I uh, randomly generated three different types of data, and uh, all are continuous variable. Okay, so the first one I generated a uh, normally distributed variable. For example, actually, serum albumin is usually normally distributed. So the data you're seeing in here is a real data from my collaborative uh, project. Then, right. So this is the data I generated, and this is the real data. Okay. So serum albumin is normally distributed, and then the next one is uh, skewed. So this is a randomly generated data, and then this is the actual data. CRP looks like this. Okay. And then the last one, very skewed, and this is Augustus Augustine score. Augustus score. <laughs> One. It's a measurement for coronary calcification. Okay. Okay. So there's some people who have no calcification, but there are a few people who have a high calcification. Very, very skewed variable. Right? So uh, for each type of data, and I generated 1,000 sets. Okay. Right. And then I computed how many times Okay, I can detect statistical significance, right? And then I chose three different types of statistical test. And one uh, test is a t-test. So I'm comparing two groups, A and B. And then uh, I use t-test, and I say without transformation. So 
uh, I didn't explain the transformation, but one way to deal with skewed data, yeah, you can apply any mathematical transformation, right? And then make data normally distributed. So for example, CRP is skewed this way. This is a good candidate to be normally distributed after you do log transformation. Okay. Many biomarkers are skewed like this. Okay. So if you do log transformation of CRP, many times you have a nice normally distributed data. So once you convert data to normal, you can do parametric tests like T-test or ANOVA. Okay. And so uh, one test, I do T-test without transformation. And other one, I went ahead to do log transformation and then did the T-test. And then the third one, I did a Wilcoxon Ransom test or Maui Niu test. Those are non-parametric tests. So whether the data are skewed or not, it doesn't affect. Non-parametric tests usually use a ranking. So the ranking, as I said, yeah, is robust for outlier, right? So we have a kindergartners. And that school principal comes in, who's age is 70, it doesn't affect the median age of these kindergartners. As long as you do ranks, i.e. number metric tests, it's robust for outliers or shape of a distribution. Okay, so those are three tests and I did in the three different types of the data. Right? And then what I'm plotting on y-axis is how many times and you see p value less than 0.05. Okay. So higher this number is better. This is a power. Power is a probability of detecting difference when there is true difference. So we know for sure there is a difference. That's how I set up stimulations. Okay. So higher power is better. So what do you think? I'll show you the result. Okay. So when the data are slightly skewed, and, and then you see difference. Okay. And then when you see a data highly, highly skewed, you have no hope to detect the difference by using a t-test with no transformation. <laughs> so what do you think? So based on this, what the test do you choose for your daily practice? Okay, so let's look one by one. When data are normally distributed, and of course log transformation make normal data to skew data, Okay, so that's why t test with t test you start losing power. The t test is valid when data are normally distributed, right? So if the data are normal, of course you want to do t test without doing anything, no transformation. So that have good power here, right? Okay, and then um, no parametric test like a Whitney U test, we've got some around some test is actually very similar in terms of statistical power. So you are not losing much by using non-parametric tests when data are normally distributed, right? And how about the middle one? Data are slightly skewed, and then t-test with no transformation and start losing power because it's violating a normality assumption, right? And then in this case, when data looks like this, log transformation usually gives good normality, right? So that's why t-test become valid and then gain power. You know what happened with the Wilcoxon test? Well, we need your test actually, I meant. You do lose a little bit of power, but not too much. Okay. You don't lose as much as you mistakenly use p-value, I mean the t-test, all right? And then the last one, what happened? Non-parametric test and t-test, fairly matched very well. Right? So non-parametric test, you don't lose much power, but you lose power tremendously by ignoring skewness and apply student t-test. Okay. So based on this and choice of test, we go with at least Department of Biostatistics at the Vanderbilt. <laughs> we use non-parametric. Yeah. Then it's actually improves the decision's quality of life. <laughs> we don't have to check the distribution for each single variable, right? Because we apply non-parametric for everything. 
that we have a computer automated program to do the parametric. <laughs> and we don't have to check distributions to see whether we should use theta or not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For all of them. Yeah. Are there any exceptions to this? Sample size, computation. Many statistical, uh, many sample size software like PS doesn't work with non-parametric tests. So in that case, we use a uh, student t-test to compute uh, sample size. But when data are skewed, student t-tests give you large sample size, more conservative size. So, um, so you could have saved sample size if you use a non-parametric formula to do sample size. But not many software do non-parametric sample size computation. So we are overestimating a little bit by using student t-test or skewed data and using PS software for sample size. Okay. So especially the Department of Biostat and Vanderbilt, we are high, uh, we are stronger to advocate non-parametric test. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then a uh, report we produced even actually at least uh, the report using program by Dr. Harrell we don't have standard deviation even. <laughs> we have only median and interval damage mean we do but not standard deviation uh, so we emphasize a lot on non-parametric test that uh, that makes sense because when data are skewed and we start losing so much power by ignoring the skewedness if you do parametric test. So you're penalizing yourself a lot okay, by ignoring the fact that data are normally not normally distributed. In this case, it's like a helpless. You know, look at this. You know, even if you enroll 50 more patients and you don't see any difference. Right. Again, what is the power? Power is probability of you detecting difference when there is a difference. So in extermination, I randomly generate 1,000 times the different data set. Right? And we know for sure there is a difference between A and B, group A and B. But when you use a student theta, 0%. <laughs> and you detect the difference. Even you repeat 1,000 times. It's a hopeless. And don't waste your time doing that. So the choice of statistical test is actually very, very important. So how hard to collect data? Is it hard to collect data? I don't know. I never collected data. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Statistician is a good occupation. We just grab with the panel. Uh, sweats and blood uh, data <laughs> and then push the button <laughs> to do analysis uh, but it's a hard right to have a smaller p-value but keep collecting data but if you, you push different button and that can influence p-value this much um, so I hope you will find a user right statistical test when there is a true difference using a right test will give you good evidence okay. if you're not seeing a good evidence you know clinically you you know for sure there's something but you're not detecting a good enough p-value that's probably means you are using a wrong method if you're using a right method you should be seeing it but your clinical intuition is so important Okay, you're already picking up a signal okay, based on your experience. And if you use the right method to analyze your data, you should be seeing a good evidence. Okay? So please, please pay attention when you select statistical test so that you don't waste your blood and sweat, your time with your family, and right? you're sacrificing so many things when you collect data. And so let's push the right button when you analyze. Okay. Can I ask a question? Sure. That? So, you know, there's a certain amount of skewness to each of these, right? Like yeah. Zero mm -hmm. to a high. Right. Yeah. And it seems like if you, if you sort of shape the curve of the actual y axis, you're 
you actually can have more power yeah, right. with, with some of the slightly skewed data than you can with either normal or with very skewed data. Right, right. So this one is depends on how skewed the data set is. So I could have generated uh, skewness in different degree. So that will affect on this. And then please don't pay attention too much on actual power because, oh, okay. yeah. So, so, so this is. Yeah, we can't really compare this to that because okay. I didn't spend enough time in simulations okay. to match this. So, so you can't so, compare. So this is the same but within this, right, you can compare. The most power it is within you this one. Yeah. yeah. So you start gaining uh, power with a non-parametric test when you have a skewed data. And then most data you're dealing with is skewed. Okay. Normality usually happens just by chance. <laughs> and I can tell you which variable is probably normally distributed. BMI, uh, probably. It depends on which country you're in. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, age is usually, uh, it is about 18. And uh, cholesterol is a little bit skewed. Not as much as this, but it's skewed. Um, but the many, many biomarkers, it may be skewed more than this. Uh, so be careful. Days, uh, days of ICU, days of hospital, days and cost, dollars, 